given us. Thank you for your many blessings in life, Father. They are just so abundant. And Lord, we do have so many needs and so many more that we could call out, Father. But we don't want to focus on those right now, Father. We want to focus on who you are, Father. You are our provider. You are our protector, Father. You are our healer. And Father, so we just proclaim promises from your word even now, Father, over our people. Father, many people are sick and afflicted, Father, but you can touch them. Father, many people are burdened down, Father, but you can touch them. Father, nothing's impossible with you, Father. So right now, we just proclaim that no weapon formed against this church body shall prosper. Father, we proclaim your goodness and your faithfulness over your people, Father. We proclaim that you do see the righteous, Father, and you do hear our cries, Father. And you are faithful and just to answer our prayers, but it's according to your will and your purpose and your perfect plan. So, Father, we offer up every single need in this place tonight. You saw the hands that were raised. Father, even the hands that didn't go up, Father, perhaps there were some who had outspoken prayer requests, Father. But, Father, we just I want to honor each one of those requests right now, Father, and lift them up to you, Father, because we know that you can meet them needs. And, Father, we pray tonight for all those on Facebook, Father. They are burdened, and probably some getting in from work late, Father, and couldn't perhaps make it here. But, Father, they've tuned in, Father, so we just want you to honor that, Father. They're still connected with us, even though they're not here in person. And we pray for those on Facebook as well, Father, the many different needs that they have the situations that they're facing father that's the beautifulness of you you can be here with us but you can also be there with them father you can meet their needs there and you can meet our needs here and we just thank you for that lord we just love you tonight we praise you and we honor you for who you are and for what you mean to us and father we offer up this prayer in the name of your son the name of jesus christ the son of the one true and only living god father let it be done let it be so according to your word father and according to your will in jesus name amen and amen so Miss Lynn last week done an excellent job, and some of you are probably like, how you know you want in here? I went back and watched it online. Um, she done an awesome job opening up with what an overcomer is, and can I just put this little plug in here? Our church offers some great, great things if you happen to miss. We have a Facebook page. We have a website. We also have an app. Most of you have smartphones. Man, the app is awesome. I listened to Miss Lynn while I was working out the other day, put it on there, and she was just a teacher, and I was working out. She was feeding me, and I was doing cardio, and it was just an awesome thing. Um, but take advantage of that, because there are some times that we cannot be here in person. We just can't. There's things that come up, perhaps vacations or whatever, sickness, but you can still be joined in and still be connected through these different means. The Lord has blessed us with through, through technology. So Take advantage of those. But like I said, I listened to Miss Lynn. She done an awesome job. Talked about David, you know, and how, how just what an overcomer was. So tonight we're going to be getting into our actual first lesson of this, and it's going to be overcoming weakness with strength. How many of you here would be on, honest enough to say tonight that there's areas in your life that you're just weak in? I'll, be the, I'll raise my hand if nobody else does. Look, the good thing is we got a lot of honest people, and the Lord loves honesty, so that's a good thing. we got a lot of hands that went up. So I want to, I want to start off with this tonight. One day, there was a little girl, and she found a cocoon in a tree. So she decided to take it down and place it in a jar and take it to her room. She was so excited, thinking about the possibility of seeing a beautiful butterfly come out of this cocoon. So a few days went by, nothing took place. A few more days went by, and then she looked, and she could see the butterfly starting to try to squirm and wiggle and get its way out. But she noticed that the opening just weren't big enough for him. So in her effort to help this poor little butterfly, what she did was she took it very carefully and she teared open that cocoon. So soon after that, it won't long at all, the butterfly had an easy exit and came right out. But something very strange took place when that, ha when that happened. You see, instead of a butterfly coming out with two beautiful wings, the butterfly came out with two withered, shriveled up, useless, ugly wings. You see, some of you might be thinking right now, well, how is that? Why in the world did that take place? See, the Lord designed that butterfly and its cocoon for a reason. That tight opening is there to strengthen and to also straighten that butterfly's wings. So that struggle is needed for that butterfly when it's coming out of that situation. You see, without the pressure of that tight opening, that butterfly was robbed of its beautiful wings, but it was also robbed of its ability to be able to fly. So I know we're not butterflies in here. We're human beings. But the same holds true for us today. We need pressures, trials, and tribulations of life 
if we are going to develop in what the Lord's called us to be. So strength comes in many different forms. But you know what? Weaknesses does as well. Some of you tonight could be struggling with a physical weakness. Perhaps maybe a mental, an emotional weakness. Perhaps even a financial weakness. But you know what? The most important weakness of all that is crippling to so many people is their spiritual weakness, their relationship with the Lord. You see, sufferings and challenges and hardships, they're universal. We all face them. At some point in time in life, we have all been faced with something that has shook us to the core. And I'm sure if we ran around the room tonight, each one of you could probably tell in detail exactly what that situation would be. But you see, it could be an external thing or it could be an internal thing. You see, the external thing could seem to be maybe you had a severe injury early in life or later on in life, and that really just became a weakness to you. Perhaps it was the loss of a family member, perhaps a friend, a loved one, a co-worker. You know, perhaps it was just being mistreated by somebody. Perhaps somebody done you so wrong and so dirty that it just injured you and scarred you so bad that now you're weak because of it. Perhaps it was something internal. And this is where I think a lot of people would struggle at. Perhaps it was low self-esteem. Perhaps being picked on when you were little or not being complimented. Perhaps it was making poor choices in life that led, led to doubt and disbelief. Perhaps it's pride. Believe it or not, there's prideful people. Perhaps it's addiction. You see, no matter whether it's external or internal, you find yourself in a weakness. So how is it possible to overcome your weakness? It's possible, and tonight we're going to learn that. Our main text tonight we're coming from is Ephesians 6 and 10, and it's going to give us the answer. And this is what it says. It says, in conclusion, this is from the Amplified, be strong in the Lord, draw your strength from him, and be empowered through your union with him and in the power of his boundless might. Now, I just read that from the Amplified. In other words, the Bible is telling us this, that we can face our challenges, circumstances, and weaknesses in life through the strength that we receive from the Lord. You see, Paul's command to be strong in the Lord is echoed all throughout the Bible. If you go through the Bible, you'll see it. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. One, this is well known, the book of Joshua. When Joshua was commissioned by the Lord to take over after Moses passed away to lead the nation of Israel, the Lord commanded him on three different occasions. What did he tell him? Be strong and be courageous. In the book of 1 Chronicles, David told Solomon, now he's telling his son this. He said, be strong and be courageous. Do not fear, for the Lord God, my God, will be with you. And then in the book of 2 Timothy, Paul prepared Timothy for his new pastoral role. He gave him this advice. He said, you, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You see, we see example after example all throughout the Bible of the Lord coming alongside people who just felt weak, who possibly didn't feel good enough, who even probably felt the absence of strength and didn't feel like they could finish the calling they had in their life, but yet the Lord came up to them and told them to be strong. How many of you have faced that in here? How many of you feel like sometimes in life that it just gets so hard and so burdened that, Lord, I know you've called me to do this, but I don't know if I can carry on. And you want to throw in the towel, but the Lord catches it and throws it back and says, I'm not finished with you yet. I mean, a lot of times we can feel that way, whether it's a, a ministry position, whether it's a, a, a secular job, whether it's a, being a parent, a father, mother, grandparent. We all can feel that way. And you see, according to Dr. David Jeremiah, I've took some, some, some from out of this book, some notes, and I've used his, his outline. But according to him, he tells us this, that, more, that on more than 30 occasions in the Bible, the Lord commands someone to be strong. That's a lot. That's a lot of times the Lord's told people to be strong. So when reading Paul's motivational words to, to the Ephesians, you might assume that this command is for them to fight. You see, after all, this passage is Ephesians 6. And what's Ephesians 6 for the Bible scholars? Put on the armor of God. But you see, and, and, and for armor of God, that means soldier. You know, he, he, he used the Roman soldier to, to, to uh, describe this. But that's not what he's doing. However, if we look at this passage very, very carefully, you'll discover it's not a call to fight. It's actually a call to stand. And what he's telling him, four, four times in Ephesians 6, Paul uses the language to stand to describe this to our spiritual strength, to stand firm, to stand tall. So 
Why are we not commanded to fight? Can somebody help, help me with that tonight? Why are we not commanded to fight in this passage here? Because Paul knows simply this. Because Christ, by his death and resurrection, has already defeated Satan. The battle's already been won. So this is why we find our passages like this in the Bible. In Romans 8, 37, it says, Yet in all things we are more than conquerors and gain an overwhelming victory through him who loves us. What about 1 Corinthians 15 and 57? It says, But thanks be to God who gives us victory as conquerors through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then also we see in 2 Corinthians 2 and 14, But thanks be to God who always leads us in victory through Christ. You see, from every spiritual perspective, you are not fighting for victory. You're fighting from victory. And that's a big thing that we have to understand. That changes everything. You see, you're called to be strong in the Lord so you can stand in victory that has, that has already been won. And that's what makes an overcomer. You, you hear what I'm saying? We, we don't have to fight for a victory. As Christians, we don't have to walk around and just land blast and fight. The, the Word of God defends itself. We don't even have to defend it. We don't have to fight for it. And that's our job to spread the gospel. But we're fighting from victory because of who we follow. Jesus Christ, when he rose from the dead, he conquered death, hell, and the grave. So when he done that, the battle was won. The enemy's already been defeated, and he knows that. So we're fighting from victory. You see, as followers of Jesus Christ, when we look back, we should know that and just have that comfort. That you, Lord, my Savior and my soon-coming King, you've already won. You know, when we as Christ followers look forward, we should take comfort in knowing that in the future, no matter what we face, we should walk in confidence, knowing that the Lord's going to lead us into victory. Amen. And we may not see that. You know, it may, we may be walking into a battlefield. Tony Evans has said this, in life there's storms. You're either going in one, you're in the middle of one, you're coming out of one, and sometimes you're in all three at the same time. And you may not can see that victory at the time. It may look like defeat is all around you, but I promise you, the Lord has never failed. You know what? He is undefeated. There's a song called Champion. He's our champion. He has never been beat. He's never going to be beat. There's nobody or nothing even equal to him. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're victorious in Christ Jesus. There's not a situation in life you're facing right now that you'll lose that battle. You know, and I know a lot of times we can look and say, well, this brother or sister is sick. They lost their battle with cancer. Or this brother and sister is sick. They lost their life in a car wreck. That's from our our perspective did they really lose their life or did they gain life if they're followers of jesus christ so we, we we don't lose battles you see this is what paul was saying to the corinthians in first corinthians he said be on guard stand firm in your faith in god respecting his precepts and keeping your doctrine sound and like mature men be courageous and be strong so this is what paul is telling you and me this evening as Christians, that we are called by the Lord to fight by standing firm. We have to take a stand so that the evil around us does not prevail. You see, it's through our faith and through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us that we have the courage and the strength to be able to stand when everyone else around us is ready to sit. Do you see it today on the news, at work? Do you see the people that's easily willing to give up? I'm just going to follow this or I'm going to do that. They're not willing to take a stand. Well, society's telling them to do this. So I think I'm going to follow them. As Christians, we have to stand bold. And we have to speak the truth in love. It's our obligation. You see, as followers of Jesus Christ, we face great challenges. We're not exempt from them. Once again, this is another thing. Well, you're a Christian. I can't believe you're even facing these things you're facing. We face challenges. Can I tell you this? The enemy don't take a break. He's not going to stop. You don't think he messed with you before because you won't say he had you. But then when you got saved and became a Christian, now you're really going to see he wants you because he's going to come after you left and right from the time you wake up to the time you lay down. Guess what? There's something in your life that tempts you. There's something in your life that is a weakness, and he knows your weakness. And I've heard pastors say this before. Guess what? If he can't get you with your weakness, he's going to get you with your strength. 
It might be pride. It might be arrogance. But the enemy's going to come at you 24-7. We are constantly a target of Satan's fiery darts. Daily, he's trying to knock us off balance. He's trying to get us to compromise. He's trying to get us to stray away. He's trying to get us to take a wrong path. He's trying to get us to make ungodly decisions every single day. He does it with everything in his power to prevent us from receiving our eternal reward and getting to our eternal destination. You see, each morning we wake up and start our day, we have to ask ourselves this. Are we going to be overcomers by the Spirit of God and by the strengths he gives us? Or are we going to be weak and fail in our flesh? Because your flesh will make you weak. Your flesh will make you fail. You see, you and I are faced with these decisions from the time we open our eyes in the morning. Think about it now. When you wake up, when your feet hit the floor, what kind of attitude are you going to have? Did you not get a good night's sleep, so I'm going to take it out on my wife or my husband? Did John Mark keep us up all night, so I'm going to take it out on Taylor? Or vice versa, Taylor on me? You know, how are we going to treat our wife, our husband? How are we going to treat our children? How are we going to treat our coworkers? How are we going to treat strangers that we come in contact with? We have decisions we have to make. And when the enemy attacks you and exposes your weakness, how are you going to respond? That's something only you know. Will you fight? Because can I tell you this? In your own physical self, you can't defeat Satan. Are you going to run? Can I tell you this? In your own physical self, you cannot run Satan. Or are you going to stand? Stand in the full power of God's strength through Jesus Christ, which will help you walk in victory because he's already defeated Satan. So overcomers stand strong in the power and strength of the Lord. You see, the scriptures tell us that the Lord is awesome and he is unlimited in strength. Psalm 68, 35 says, Oh God, you are awesome and profoundly majestic from your sanctuary. The Lord God of Israel gives strength and power to his people. Blessed be God. Then it says in Isaiah 26, 4, Trust confidently in the Lord forever. He is your fortress, your shield, your banner. For the Lord God is the everlasting strength. He's the rock of ages. So the Lord has promised to give strength to you and to me when we need it. And this is why Isaiah 40 and 28 says, Do you not know? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become tired or grow weary? There is nothing, no searching from his understanding. He gives strength to the weary and to him who has no might, he increases power. So if you translate this Old Testament promise into New Testament language, you'd probably hear something like this. It'd be Paul saying this in Philippians 4.13. I can do all things, you know, from him, Christ, who gives me strength and empowers me to fulfill his purpose. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I'm ready to do anything equal and anything through him for the strength and peace he gives me. So how can we tonight access God's strength? This is where I'm going to use you. How can we access God's strength? Through his word. Through prayer. Miss Lynn's read the book, so she's already got the first one. We can access God's strength from his word. That's the first one we're going to look at. Do we have any questions or comments before we get started? Okay. So there was a Bible scholar, R.A. Torrey, and he was once approached by a man who was complaining because he was reading his Bible, yet he won't get nothing from it. So Torrey told the man this. This is a Bible scholar. He said, read your Bible. The man replied, I do read it. Torrey which replied back to him and said, well, read it some more. Then he told him this. He said, let me suggest this to you. Read sec he, he said, told the man, take one book of the Bible, just one book of the Bible, read it 12 times a day for a month. And he suggested to the man this. He said, let me lead you to 2 Peter. There's only three chapters. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll make it easy for you. So the man took his advice. Him and his wife read 2 Peter three to four times in the morning, two to three times at noon, three to four times at night. Soon the man said he began to talk Second Peter everywhere he went. Work, home, the marketplace, wherever he went, he was talking things from Second Peter. 
And it said that he would even mark his Bible with color pencil. After read over and over, just reading it, he would mark different things. Oftentimes, he said he would cry. And when tears would hit the pages of the Bible, it would mix in with the, with the color, with the markers, and it would kind of smear and stain his Bible. So the man told his wife, he said, I have ruined my Bible. He said, all this marking I've done and crying over it from reading it, I have ruined it. His wife quickly responded with this. She said, as the pages on your Bible gotten darker, your life gotten, it got lighter. You understand what I'm saying there? The man was spending time in his word. He was, the pages were getting dirty, the pages were getting marked on, but his life was getting lighter as that was getting dirtier. And there's a saying that goes this, a Bible that's falling apart normally is a life that's not. You see, there's something we have to understand when it comes to God's word. It is full of principles to learn. It is full of commands to follow, standards to live by, and promises to trust in. You see, all the strength that you'll ever need can be found in God's Word. I said this the other Sunday. You don't need to go nowhere. You don't need to go to Google. You don't need to go to Mom and Daddy. Go to God's Word. Now, I'm not saying don't talk to your parents. I talk to my daddy all the time. Me and him, every time I get around and we talk about the Word. Sometimes we talk about the Word so much, Mom wants us to go outside and talk about it. She don't want us to be inside. And <laughs> for those on Facebook, that was my death thing. Amen. <laughs> but it, it, all the answers we'll ever need are right there in God's Word. You see, because a Bible that's sitting on a shelf is full of strength and truth. However, that changes absolutely nothing in your life until you take it from the shelf and put it in your heart and mind. You see, you may mark your Bible when you read it, but does your Bible mark you? You see, you may read through your Bible, but does your Bible read you? You say, you may read your Bible just to check off, I got to do this today. Or when you read your Bible, do you let it check you? You see, we access the power and strength from the Lord in our lives by not just reading God's Word. Now, hear me out. I just, tell you, I just told you to read it, so I'm not contradicting myself. But what I'm telling you is this. It takes more than reading it. We need to memorize it. We need to listen to it. We need to meditate on it. But most importantly, we need to obey it. Because if you don't apply it to your life, Reading the Bible is like reading, just reading any other book. If you read it, put it down, and don't listen to what it says, it's just like picking up a magazine at the store. But when you apply it to your life and the change starts to take place, you're doing something. You see, there's a familiar story in the Bible that will help us understand just how important knowing God's Word is. There was a man named Jesus, and the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. And for 40 days, he fasted. And what's the Bible say? that Satan came against him. Satan came to attack and tempt him because he knew physically Jesus was weak. He hadn't ate or drank in 40 days. So when Satan attacked him, what did he attack him with? The lust of the flesh, which was physical desires, physical appetite, the lust of the eyes, and also with the pride of life, which was his physical achievements. You see, however, Jesus used the strength from God's word to overcome his physical weaknesses. See, Jesus knew what was written in God's Word. And the same holds true for us today. We didn't know what's written in God's Word because, can I tell you, if the enemy attacked Jesus, he's going to attack Tony, he's going to attack Mark, he's going to attack Lynn, he's going to attack Taylor, Aaron, Lynn to the second power, myself. He's going to attack every single one of us. If you're a Christian, the enemy is going to come against you. He's going to attack you. And we need to be able to use exactly what Jesus used. It is written. Because if you know what's written when the enemy comes, guess what? He's going to go. So we have to know. It does, you it does you absolutely no good if the only time you open your Bibles and hear what pastor says, open your Bible to Psalms 27. If you're not reading for yourself at home, if, and there's no excuse to stay in time. A lot of you don't like to read this, and I understand that. But you know what? You can put the Bible on this. You can put the Bible on your car. You can listen to on the radio. There's CDs you can buy. There's no excuse for getting in God's Word this day and time. There is no excuse. And I say that out of love. I love enough to tell you that if you don't read God's Word, it's on you. It's not because there's a lack of resources. So we need to be in God's Word. You know why? Because accessing God's Word will help you overcome weakness with strength. The second thing, does somebody want to take a stab at this one? What's another way that we can find God's strength to overcome weakness? 
I touched on this one a little bit a few Sundays ago when I spoke. And this, it's in Dr. David Jeremiah's notes as well. Miss Lane, you want to tell them? She didn't read out of the book. <laughs> we access God's strength through worship. Not just through his word, but also through worship. You see, when your heart is caught up in worship, the worship of the Lord, something happens on the inside. I don't know about you, but I can start off with a bad day. I can start off that morning rough. But when I get in my car, that little 10-minute drive I've got from Plainview to Dunn, if I put on some good Christian music, and a lot of times I, I got I got iPods. I've already got songs down that I really like and I, ones I really know are going to get me stirred emotionally. There's something about it. When you can put on some good music, good Christian music, and, man, it, it can change your day just like that. I mean, you can start off in a bad mood, but time you get to work, you're rejoicing because something on the inside begins to stir. That something's called the Holy Spirit. Let's just call it what it is. The Holy Spirit begins to stir and begins to move, and it begins to just change your attitude. I talked about the other day when the Lord comes on the scene, the atmosphere changes. Things take place that, you know, we don't quite understand. But, you see, worship fills your heart with the worthiness of the Lord, and it lifts up your spirit. You see, the Bible tells us this on many different occasions, how worship does. And this is one of my favorite ones. And I, when I read this every time, I think about us today. If we would just apply this to what we're facing today in our country, Habakkuk 3, 17 and 19 says this. Though the fig trees do not blossom, there's no fruit on the vines, there's no yield of olives, the fields are producing no food, the flock's been cut off from the fold, there's no cattle in the stalls, all this bad stuff's going on, but Habakkuk says, yet I still, I choose to rejoice in the Lord. I choose to shout of praise of, victorious, of my victorious God of my salvation. So we can apply that to us today. Though gas prices are rising, I'm going to choose to rejoice. You know, though the economy looks like it's starting to tank, I'm going to choose to rejoice. Though chaos is going on between Republicans and Democrats, I'm going to choose to rejoice. Though churches are shutting the doors because of fear of different things, I'm going to choose to rejoice. Despite what's going on in our country, let me tell you as a Christian, choose to rejoice because the world's watching how you act. They see, I'm just going to be blunt, ignorance all over TV. When they look at a Christian, they want to see something different. They don't want to see the same ignorance. They want to see something completely different to say, I want what that pastor's got. Though things are going crazy on, he's still having church. He's still feeding his flock. He's still having staff meetings. He's still sending out emails. He's choosing to rejoice. We need to be that way, people, as Christians. We don't need to to blend in with the world. We're called to stand out. So can I just tell you, choose to rejoice tonight. When you leave this place, you may come up on a wreck. Pray for that situation, but don't let fear set in. Choose to rejoice. And I say that because mom and dad said coming here, they saw a car flying by the intersection right up here. It didn't even stop. It just, about 50 miles an hour, just went flying through. Imagine if there had been another car coming there. Could have been a bad situation. But they're at church, and they're still choosing to rejoice. So worship is something that you have to choose to do regardless of what's going on around you. You see, whether things are good on the mountaintop or whether things are not so good in the valley, choose to worship. You know, I said this Sunday, worship is a lifestyle. It's not lyrics on a screen. You see, the Lord's not looking for warriors. He's looking for worshipers that will worship him in spirit and in truth. So if, if, worship's a life, if, if worship is not a lifestyle of you and it's lyrics, can I tell you tonight in love, let's flip that. Because those songs are very good. And, we, and I, I love, I just told you, I love to listen to good Christian music. But if the only time I can really worship God is when I listen to a song, let's change that mentality. Because and the only time you worship is when you come to these pews and you stand up because Jonathan Hall tells you to stand and our praise and worship team is doing an awesome job like always. If that's the only time you worship, can I tell you tonight, let's change that. You know, you should be worshiping before you come to church, when you get to church, and when you leave the church. Amen. Worship's a lifestyle. It's something that you just choose to do regardless. And I'd like to tie this in because I said it the other day. We have to understand what worship is. Worship's not something we begin. We don't just begin it when we get to church. We don't begin it when we put our favorite song on. It's something that we join into. You see, because it says in Revelation that there are angelic beings around the throne. All day and all night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's worship. 
So what they're doing is worshiping 24-7. So when you begin to worship down here, you're not beginning something. You're joining into a heavenly worship. And what you're doing then is partaking in a heavenly worship, and you're doing something so awesome. You're bringing heaven down to earth. And that's when things begin to change. So once again, we have to understand worship. You see, you can face life's challenges head on when you know that you can worship the Lord who is greater and stronger than anything that could ever come against you. We have to choose to worship. You overcome weakness with strength when you access the Lord through worship. Here's a third and final point. We can access God's strength, and this is going to be tough for some of us, and I, I, I'll be the first to tell you for me, by waiting. Waiting is hard for many of us to do, and I get it honest, Facebook, I get it from my daddy and my mama, but mainly my daddy. My daddy's not very patient, and I'm not. I mean, I'll, I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not very patient. Patience is not a strong suit for many people. If we're honest, it's not a strong suit for many people. However, the Bible says this, that when we wait on the Lord, he shall renew our strength. You see, Psalms 27 says this, wait for and confidently expect the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for and confidently expect the Lord. So the purpose of waiting is this, and this is why it's important to wait. The purpose of waiting is to accept the unfolding and revealing of God's plan in his time, not yours. We live in a society that is, wants instant results. I'm going to work out tomorrow and I'm going to take this protein shake. If I don't wake up ripped, I'm taking that thing back to the store. You know, I'm going to take this diet pill. If I don't lose weight within a week, I'm taking it back to the store. We want instant we, want, we live in a microwave society. We pop it in, we're ready to pop it out and go on with it. That's not how it works in the spiritual life. You see, we have to wait upon the Lord. Waiting is the complete opposite of what our society would tell us to do. So let me give you some tips here. How can we wait on the Lord? You ready for this? Now we all need to take this advice. The first thing to do is just simply slow down. You see, just take a moment to think about how fast-paced our life is today and just how much that impacts the peace of our life and our soul. We live in a, we live in a society with schedules. And I, I'm, like I said, I, I'm, I'm preaching to myself. From the time I get up, Taylor's getting ready. I'm getting ready. We're getting Jomart ready. We leave from doing that. He either goes to work with me. I take him to daycare. Pick him up from preschool. He goes to work with me or goes to pastor. I've got to work. We're on a schedule. I mean, but we, we feel like we have no time to even breathe sometimes from the time we get up till we lay back down. But can I tell you, slow down. It is a must, not an option, not a maybe. It is a must that we make time to get in God's word and his presence. There's no ifs, ands, buts about it. You see, slowing down will require two things that we don't like once again. It will require discipline and dedication. Slowing down means we have to shut down all the activities that are causing us to speed up. So we have to slow down. And here's the next thing that's going to be hard for some of us. We have to be quiet. After we slow down, we have to be quiet. You see, we are overwhelmed daily with noise, distractions, technology, and the uproar of our culture. Wanting us to go here, do that, do this, do that. Just think about this for a minute. About every restaurant you go to now, there's TVs. There's sports on TVs. There's game tablets at tables. About every restaurant you go to, it's there. What about doctor's offices when you go in there to wait? There's TVs in there. And what's on there? Game shows. The news. TV land at the office I used to go to. I used to watch Gilligan's Island all the time when I was in there. But there's stuff constantly going on. What about in our towns and cities we live in? You think about it. There's the endless noise of trains going through, of construction being done, of car horns blowing, of emergency sirens blasting. There's constant noise everywhere we're at. What about our own house? Now, this is one to get us. TVs, tablets, laptops, smartphones are constantly playing beeping or alerting us to let us know something's going on just happened to me a while ago i was going over my notes and stuff and i got alert on my phone i looked and one of the guards for oklahoma in the tournament coming up's got COVID, and i was like oh it's then started but it distracted me from what i was doing i was trying to study but yet my phone alerts me to tell me about about a sports thing it's just how it is 
You see, honestly, there's noise and distractions everywhere we go. We can't get away from it. Our world is blanketed with these noises, loud, unsettling. And it affects us, whether you know it or not, physically, mentally, and definitely spiritually, it affects us. So if you want the strength for your soul to grow, if you want to strengthen yourself and kind of get rid of some stress, you need to be aware of God's voice. And that takes being quiet. You see, we don't want to be like Elijah was. You know, as good as a prophet he was in his weakness, what did he do? He looked for the loud and flashy things to find God in. You see, there was a dynamic events took place. There was a powerful windstorm. There was a great earthquake. There was flaming fire. God, you got to be in this. You got to be in that. He wasn't there. It's when all that calmed down, when all them events got quiet, there was a still small voice. And Elisha heard it. So that voice that Elisha heard to give him strength and courage is the voice we need to be listening to. But it's going to take slowing down and getting quiet. And the last thing, now this is important, and if you're a Christian, you better know it's important, and that's pray. After we slow down, after we get quiet, we need to pray. You see, prayer is the river in which the Lord's strength flows into our life. And it's a never-ending river, and it runs constantly as long as we utilize it. You see, perhaps you're weak in your life because you've not slowed down enough to get quiet enough to ask the Lord for strength. Perhaps that's why you're weak tonight. And if you are, there's a challenge that Dr. David Jeremiah used in his book, and I'm going to challenge us with it. It's called the Be Still Challenge. And what this challenge is, is every day find, he said find, or make at least 10 minutes in your schedule to sit down somewhere quiet, to pray. Before you open God's word, to pray. Ask him to reveal his word to you, to open your eyes physically and spiritually to receive what he has for you. And after you pray and get in God's word, take time to reflect on what you've read. Now, I understand sometimes we like to read quick devotions, a scripture or two with a phrase or two and go on about our business. Can I encourage you? That's all fine and well. But can I encourage you to really get in God's word, to really dig in his word? You remember that example I used a while, long time ago about a butterfly and a bee? The bee really gets down in there while the butterfly just kind of skims the top. We don't want to be skimmers of the word. We want to dig deep into God's word. So spend time in God's word. Um, and he, he said this after that. He said, but to make this work and to be the most effective it can be, this is going to be hard. Turn off your TVs, silence your phones, get away from any distractions. For me, this time for me, I've told you, you know, it, is first thing in the morning. Taylor's asleep. John Mark's asleep. I get up early. I can read my Bible because I know once everybody gets up, the schedule starts. It's time to roll because John Mark don't slow down. His legs nor his mouth from the time he wakes up to the time he lays down. His mama this, daddy this, Zoe this, papa this, nana this, grandma this. It's constantly. That's Taylor all day, every day. But I love it. I wouldn't trade it for nothing. But from the time he gets up, he lays down. The schedule's on. So that's my time. For Taylor, it's the complete opposite. Hers is late at night. When John Mark's going to sleep and I'm in there scratching his back because he wants Daddy to scratch his back after he's had Mama all day, he finally wants Daddy at the end of the day, Taylor can read her Bible. That's her time. There's no right or wrong time. I'm just encouraging you to get in God's Word. But read the passage or the specific text in the Bible to yourself. Now, this may sound weird, but after you read it to yourself, read it out loud. And then highlight, notate, do whatever circle anything in that word that stands out to you. Mr. Joe Dan's got a, a saying called a rhema word. If there's, it could be one word and just circle it and, or just remember it. And I guarantee you through that day you're going to need it. I, I promise you, you will. But do that. And then he says, at the end of your quiet time, do the same thing you did when you started it. And that's pray. Open your Bible study with prayer. Close it with prayer. That's the seal. It's like a sandwich. That's what makes it work. So, Pray that the scriptures you've read and that you've meditated on will strengthen you to overcome your weaknesses. And you'll be amazed how over time that 10 minutes that you once had to fight to get will all of a sudden turn into 20 minutes, possibly 30 minutes of Bible reading and prayer. I promise it'll happen. So you overcome your weakness for strength when you slow down enough to get quiet enough 
to wait on the Lord. So in closing, I just want to simply leave you with this. The Lord said this to Paul, and you know what? He sent it to you tonight as well. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, he says this, My grace is sufficient for you. My love and kindness, mercy are more than enough, always available regardless of the situation, for my power is being perfected, which means it is completed and shows itself most effectively in your weakness. Can we pray? Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for the study by Dr. David Jeremiah, Father. Just thank you for the different nuggets that he's given us in this lesson that we can take it and apply it to ourselves, Father. Truly help us tonight, Father, to, to get still to get quiet, Father, and to really seek you through your word, Father, because your word is so powerful. It is alive. It is active, Father. It is full of promises, that I, as I've said, Father, promises that we can really hold on to in times of weakness, Father, that we can use it, Lord, and you'll strengthen us. So, Father, it's my prayer tonight that whether those listen on Facebook or those here in person, Father, that they take the time to get into your word, Father, that they take the time to find a promise, to learn your principles, to follow your commands, and just obey your word, Father. Help us to be better Christians. Father, help us to be a better Christian tomorrow than we were today, Father. Help us to follow you, Father, better than we ever have before in these last days. Father, once again, I thank you for each and every person that's here tonight, Father. I pray your blessings upon them. I pray your blessings upon those who've watched online tonight, Father. And I just pray, Father, your goodness and your mercy and your grace continue to follow them, Father. And I pray tonight as we end this service, Father, and as we go our separate ways, that you keep us safe until the next appointed time, Father, that you encamp your angels around us and that you just lead and guide us, Father. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We honor you tonight, Father. Above all else, we honor you, Lord. We love you, Father. Let it be done. Let it be so. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen.